the preacher, teacher, and writer, Charles Swindoll tells the story of a couple that went through a drive through at a fried chicken franchise. They ordered two meals. The meals were given to them in a bucket. They were on a picnic. They made their way off to the picnic site, and when they arrived at the picnic site and went to eat the meals, they had an interesting discovery. I read to you now the words of Chuck Swindoll. After driving to the picnic site, he writes, the two of them sat down to enjoy some chicken. Well, they discovered a whole lot more than chicken. They discovered over $800 in the bucket. But the man was unusual. He quickly put the money back in the bag, then they got back into the car, and they drove all the way back to the franchise. By then, the manager was frantic. Mr. Clean got out, walked in, and became an instant hero. I want you to know that I came by to get a couple of chicken dinners and wound up with all this money here, he said. Well, as you might imagine, the manager was thrilled to death. He said, let me call the newspaper. I'm going to have your picture put in the local paper. You're one of the most honest men I have ever met. To which the man quickly responded. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that, he said. Don't do that. Then he leaned in closer and whispered. You see, the woman I'm with, she's somebody else's wife. <laughs> so there you have it. And with the words of that story ringing in our ears, I go to 1 John chapter 1. We started 1 John last week, a series entitled simply Radical. We go back this week to 1 John 1. You will remember that John is writing to people, followers of his, churches of his, who are facing some difficulties in terms of those who have crept into their fellowship and are creating problems. So we begin this week with 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. John writes, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. With that brief statement, John lays out for us one of two key statements he will make in this letter. In fact, some scholars say if you take these two key statements, you can say this is the thrust of the entire letter. Everything else that John has to say is an outgrowth of one of these two key statements. We've just read the first one, those three words, God is light. Later in his letter, we will read another three words, God is love. Those two realities form the outline for this letter. God is light, God is love. God is light, as we have just said, and as light, he illumines our minds, helps us, under, helps us to understand his thought, his heart, his mind, his will, will. And so his light helps us with our belief. Later we will read God is love. We will understand that that's the essence of who he is. And so he calls us in our human relationships to be love, that love ought to guide every choice we make, every action we take. Light, having to do with our beliefs. Love, having to do with our ethics. That's the gospel of John. So today he makes the proclamation, God is light. Now everything he will say in our passage today focuses around three claims John's opponents are making. Three claims, three beliefs that they have that they say are true. And John is contesting that fact. Now, as we read through the passage, we will see clearly how John outlines their claims and his counter-arguments. In fact, I want you to look at the screen for a simple little outline, a little graph that will help us understand exactly how today's passage unfolds. The first claim, verse 6, if we claim we have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness. That's the first claim they're making. John's response is, but if we walk in the light, and then he'll continue. Second claim in verse 8, if we claim we have not sinned, 
And then he talks about that. And then in verse 9, he gives his counterclaim. But if we confess our sins. And then finally, the third claim. If we claim in verse 10, we have not sinned. And then in 2 verse 1, but if anybody does sin. So that's the outline of today's passage. If we claim, and John's response. If we claim, John's response. If we claim, and John's response. It's interesting to me as I have read, as I have studied this passage, how contemporary are some of the claims his opponents are making? The first claim that they make, with which John takes issue, we could summarize with this statement. How I live doesn't matter. How I live doesn't matter. 1 John chapter 1, we start with verse 6. His first, if we claim. Verse 6 says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, that's God, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. His response, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. There were people in John's churches affecting his communities who were saying, we walk in the light. That was their claim. We walk with God. We walk in the light. We know his mind. We understand him. And yet the reality of their lives showed something very different. It did not show a light life characterized by light. So John takes issue with their claim, how we live doesn't matter. I wonder about that. Most of us would never say that in those words, how we live doesn't matter. We wouldn't make that confession. But I wonder about our lives. I wondered about mine as I studied this passage this week. I wonder, does my walk with Jesus make a difference in how I treat my family? Maybe you should ask, does my walk with Jesus make a difference in how I treat my patients? Maybe we should all ask, does my walk with Jesus make a difference when I encounter somebody in the parking structure just across the street and we've both spied an empty stall right at the same moment? Does my walk with Jesus matter when I sit taking a quiz in class uncertain of the answer and I can see my neighbor's answer? Does my walk with Jesus matter when it comes time to file that form that Uncle Sam calls the 1040 form? Does my walk with Jesus make a difference when I'm in a conflict with my spouse and I'm tempted to exaggerate what my spouse said just to win the argument? Does my walk with Jesus matter when it comes to the websites on which I click, to the movies I watch, to the images upon which I linger? Does my walk with Jesus matter? It's very easy to live compartmentalized lives. That's the religious area of my life. This is the rest of my life. And the two really don't have anything to do with each other. I am one person when I come to church, but the rest of the week, well, most of us wouldn't say outright how we live doesn't matter. But the people in John's churches, they were making a claim very much like that. And John took issue with them. He said, how can you claim to walk in the light and yet live in the darkness? One commentary put it this way. They said, we're getting a suntan, and yet they worked in the coal mine. No possibility of both. We probably ought to ask ourselves some questions. Seven or eight years ago, my good friend Carl Hafner preached here at the University Church. He told a story that day I want to remind you of. Some of you were here when he preached. I called Carl this week just to make sure I had the details correct. Carl was with his brother in the Caribbean. They were in Jamaica. They were swimming off the coast of Jamaica, the beautiful azure waters of the Caribbean. They were there having a great time, and they were getting close to the shore when a man waded out into the water where they were and said something to Carl. 
Carl listened, but because of the noise and the accent, he couldn't quite understand what the man was saying. He said, pardon me. The man said it again. Said it two or three times. He was still trying to understand what he said. When Carl's brother began to laugh, he understood. Began to laugh. What are you laughing at? Well, you know what he said. What did he say? He, he, he's offering to sell you a joint. Wants to know if you want some weed. The man, and Carl's brother laughed and said to the man, you realize the man you're talking to is a preacher. Now the man looks surprised. He looked at him and said, you a preacher, man? And he said, yes, I am. He says, what church do you preach in? He said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And the man said, really? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> And Carl said, really? <laughs> I wouldn't have known. <laughs> How we live, they said, doesn't matter. We're walking in the light. And John says, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. wait. How you live does matter. And I'll tell you that you're not walking in the light. How is it that he knows they're not walking in the light? Well, he tells us in his response to them. He says, those who walk in the light have fellowship with one another, and they know a sin-forgiving relationship with Jesus. In other words, if you're walking in the light, the people around you will know it by the way you treat them. And your relationship to the one above you will characterize your sincerity. So I guess that leaves us with some questions. What if you came to my house, came to my neighborhood, asked my wife, asked my kids, is Randy walking in the light? Would they be able to answer that question in the affirmative based on our fellowship, on our koinonia, our community together? Would my neighbors know that? Or according to Abraham Lincoln in one of the quotes earlier in the service, would my cat and dog know that? John says, you can claim to be walking in the light all day long, but if the people around you don't have that sense, then something is wrong because how you live matters. But the same is true in your relationship with God. Your relationship with God must be of a quality, of a depth, of an authenticity that it speaks of communal interaction with Him. So John in today's passage is talking about God being the light. He says God is the light. There's no darkness in Him. I know that some of you are claiming to live in the light. Well... When you live in a way that says, how I live doesn't matter, you're not actually walking in the light. A second claim that they make. Not only are they saying by their lifestyle, how we live doesn't matter, but secondly, they're saying, nothing's wrong with us. Nothing at all. We go back to 1 John chapter 1, this time reading verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, this is John's response, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's nothing wrong with us. What are you talking about? Now, John seems to have known that that would be their response to what he said about the first claim because he finished out the first claim. You remember saying, the blood of Jesus' his Son purifies us from all our sins. It's almost as though he intuitively know how these people would respond to hearing that their sins were being purified. It seems that he knew that they would say, what do you mean our sins are being purified? What sins? You're implying something's wrong with us? Nothing is wrong with us. We're just fine. No problem here. Now, the language and the thrust of what John says suggests that in this situation, he is talking about the power of sin, the nature of sin within them. In other words, that he's saying, 
If you claim that there's not something off kilter inside of you as a part of your very nature, you're just deceiving yourself. There is something off kilter. As the ancient prophet Jeremiah said it, the human heart is corrupt, desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And that's John's point. If you claim nothing wrong here, I'm basically good all the way deep down deep inside. John says you're deceiving yourself. You will remember the name of the late M. Scott Peck. Scott Peck, therapist and writer, many followed his writings over the years of his career. Peck tells the story of being in a therapeutic situation with a young man, a boy named Bobby, who was 15 years old. He was very emotionally distraught, even disturbed, and one could understand why. Bobby's older brother, just a year older, had killed himself with a gun not long before. As Peck talked with him, he asked him questions about that. He asked him wider ranging questions about his family, how they interacted with each other, the qualities of their relationship together. And at one point, Peck asked him the question. This past Christmas, did your parents give you a Christmas gift? And Bobby said, yes, they did. And Peck asked, what did they give you? And Bobby said, they gave me a gun. Peck was horrified. They gave you a gun? Yes. You mean li like, like the gun with which your brother shot himself? No, said Bobby to Peck's relief. But then he said, no, they didn't give me a gun like the one he shot himself with. They gave me the gun he shot himself with. Peck was astounded. I want to read you his ruminations, his reflections on that two decades later. After he had converted to Christianity, he wrote about that encounter with these words. One thing has changed for me in 20 years. I now know Bobby's parents were evil. I did not know it then. I felt their evil, but I had no vocabulary for it. My supervisors were not able to help me name what I was facing. The name did not exist in our professional vocabulary, vocabulary as scientists rather than priests. We weren't supposed to think in such terms. Interestingly enough, as Peck worked also with prisoners, he found evil there, but again, had a difficult time giving words to it. One more piece of his reflection, he says, the central defect of evil is not the sin, but the refusal to acknowledge it. Interesting, isn't it? The central defect of evil, asserted Peck, is not the sin, but the refusal to acknowledge it. What was it that John said? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we walk around claiming, no problem here, nothing wrong with me, my heart's just fine, and refuse to own it, Peck would say, John would say, trouble. So what is John's response to that claim? Well, his response is one of the most beloved verses of Scripture. In the face of those who are saying, no problem here, nothing wrong with me, John says, you're deceiving yourself because there is a problem there in the human heart. And then he says this, if we confess our sins, in other words, if we own it, if we recognize it, in humility and authenticity say, yes, there is a problem in my heart. Then John says, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
I think, may be one of the reasons we fear to own who we are, to say it with clarity and authenticity, is the fear that maybe it will overwhelm us, the fear that there is no solution, there is no fix. If we somehow admit to it, we'll start coming to pieces, and if we go to pieces, we'll never get it all back together again. And yet John says precisely the opposite. If you own it, if you confess it, he's faithful. He's just. He'll forgive and cleanse. Reminds me of the ancient proverb, probably penned by Solomon. The one who covers his sin, the one who hides her sin, will not prosper. But the one who confesses and forsakes sin will find mercy. That's John's answer. So he's facing people down, people who have claimed to live in the light, and yet along with that claim, who either by their lives or by what they say are making some counterclaims that John says are not compatible. First one, how we live doesn't matter. John says, oh, yes, it does. And whether or not you live in the light will be told in your relationships with others and with God. Jesus can forgive you. And they say, what do you mean forgive us? There's nothing wrong with us. John says, oh, yes, there is. Furthermore, if you confess it, if you own it, God will forgive. But there's a third if we claim. As we go back to 1 John 1, this third if we claim could be summarized by saying, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. The first case when he dealt with sin, John is dealing with the power, the nature of sin. This time as he deals with it, he's dealing with the individual actions of sin. I'm not doing anything wrong was the refrain. 1 John 1, verse 10. John says, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him, that is God, out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. Those are strong words. There was apparently a strand of belief in John's community that was saying you can absolutely, utterly, and completely rise to a level where you will not sin. It's amazing how contemporary Scripture can be. We have those among us. I say this with love and respect. But we have those among us who make the same claim today. Who will say that before the second coming of Jesus, we are to grow to a level, to a condition of perfection where we are characterized by perfect sinlessness. We are to rise to a level where we have overcome every sin in our lives, where there is no sin, where we can make that claim, I no longer sin. In fact, some make that a presupposition for the coming of Christ. Jesus is waiting on us to achieve that level, and then he will come back to take us to be with himself. It is not a new belief. It has its own uniquenesses for our generation, but it in itself is not a new belief. In fact, listen to the words of scholar David Jackman, evangelical scholar who writes this, down the centuries there have been groups in the church who have believed and taught that it is possible for a Christian to live without sin. By this they do not mean simply enjoying the victory of faith through union with Christ, which Romans 6 teaches. Rather, they believe that the old sinful nature is so subdued as to be eradicated and that as a consequence they teach that life can be lived on a totally higher plane. But John tells us that if we think that we are without sin, we are deluded. We deceive ourselves and probably no one else and certainly not God. Now, I want you to notice the degree of seriousness that John places on this. In the first case, talking about the sin nature, 
He says, if you think that nothing's wrong inside, you deceive yourselves. But in this case, talking about the sinful actions, here's what he says. He says, if you make that claim, you call God a liar. Those are awfully strong words. John must feel that very deeply. Now, as you understand the flow of John's argument, you may end up at a place that John appears to have feared his readers in the ancient world would end up at. You may end up at a place that says, well, then what's the use? What's the point? If we've got something wrong inside of us, but we're never going to achieve a place where we fully and completely overcome it, then what's the purpose? Maybe the first objection is true. How we live doesn't matter. Well, John's not done. He has one more solution. We go to 1 John, this time chapter 2 and verse 1. Notice what he says to those who are ready to throw in the towel and who would say, then it doesn't really matter after all. Here's what he says. My dear children, that's a term of affectionate endearment in the original language. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's as though John knew that as people read what he wrote, they would come to the point of saying, then what's the point? So he immediately adds and says, wait a minute. Before you go there, let me tell you my purpose in writing. My purpose in writing is so that you will grow, that you will experience victory in your walk with Jesus, so that you will become more mature, so that you will not continue to practice sin. That's my purpose. But John is ever realistic. And he says, however, understand that as you walk this journey of light, you walk it in the context of a God who loves and cares for you, of a Jesus who understands what it is to be human. So as you grow toward maturity, if and when you fall, take heart. Because with God, in whose presence Jesus lives, there is forgiveness. John is calling us to something that is not that different from which Paul calls us, to which Jesus calls us. Paul uses different terminology in Ephesians when he says the, the goal, the desire, the aim of our walk. He doesn't say is perfection, perfect sinlessness. He says the aim to which we strive is maturity in Christ. He calls us upward to be mature people. Jesus refers to the same reality in his simple little parable of the plant of corn. You remember that when he says you put the seed in the ground? And then the plant begins to grow, and it becomes a shoot. It grows taller. Finally, it's full grown. And then the, the, the ear appears on the stalk, and it is green. But finally, it comes to complete maturity where you can pluck it and eat it. Jesus is saying at every stage in that process, the plan is perfect for the stage it's at. But it's not yet mature. There will come a day when it reaches full maturity. That's the same reality that Paul discusses, that John writes about. God calls us upward. He calls us to victory in our Christian lives, not toward perfect sinlessness, but toward maturity in Christ. In fact, when does that perfect sinlessness appear? John is very clear about that in two chapters, actually a chapter away. When he says this, what we shall be does not yet appear, but we know this. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
In other words, in that transformational moment of encountering Jesus, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we become like him. So as we grow, let it never be said, nothing wrong with what I'm doing. That can be a spiritual arrogance that blinds us to our need. But on the other hand, John's response to that is not to say, kick back and go to heaven in a lazy boy. No, 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 no. He calls us on the upward journey toward maturity in Christ. And so John writes about walking in the light. He says, there are those among you that claim to walk in the light. But something's wrong, because either by their confession or by their lives, there are three things that concern me. One, they seem to be saying how we live doesn't matter, and it does. They seem to be saying there's nothing wrong in here, and there is. They seem to be saying what I'm doing, nothing wrong with it, and he's saying yes, there is. And John is calling them, John is calling us to an honest sincere, authentic confession of our condition that we might then grow in Him. It was Earth Day, 1971. On that day, television premiered a commercial. It was an, a memorable commercial because one day, years later, it would be voted as one of the 50 most important commercials of all time. It was a commercial featuring a Native American gentleman. He was known as Iron Eyes Cody. This Native American was seated in a canoe. He was paddling in his canoe as the camera began to pan out and to pull back from the immediacy of the scene of this Native American paddling in the canoe, you begin to see more fully what surrounded him. He was on the water. He was not just on the water paddling, but there in that water, you begin to see refuse and garbage and trash floating all around him. You begin to, to, to pull back from that scene with disgust. But the further the camera turned back, Panned backward, the more you saw. Soon in the background, you saw the large smokestacks belching poisonous gases into the environment, into the atmosphere. It created a level of disgust in the viewer. Finally, the camera, after it had panned back and seen those other scenes, zoomed in on the face of Iron Eyes Cody. And as it zoomed in on his face, there on that noble Native American face, you saw one tear trickle down his cheek. Voted is one of the 50 most important commercials of all time. But there was an after story to that. It specifically had to do with Iron Eyes Cody. There were a couple of other Hollywood figures, one of them a stuntman named Running Deer, and one of them a person known in the television show as Tonto. Jay Silverheels, the comrade to the Lone Ranger. Both of them were Native Americans, so both of them were interested in the commercial and what it portrayed, and both of them became convinced that Iron Eyes Cody was not Native American. Well, they begin to investigate, and pretty soon there, there developed enough of an impetus with the story that it was investigated by others. Others who followed the story all the way to its genesis, followed Iron Eyes Cody's story all the way back to his original hometown, little town in Louisiana. And there they discovered that Iron Eyes Cody was a full-blooded Italian. Italian, not Native American. And they raised that. They were upset by that. How did Iron Eyes Cody respond? He responded by doubling down. Continued to braid his hair as a Native American, wear the garb. Continued to speak of how he spoke with the Great Spirit. And continued to live as Iron Eyes Cody. So there you have it. 
Iron Eyes Cody, and John. Two ways to approach our lives, our spiritual conditions. How we live doesn't matter. Nothing wrong in here. What I'm doing is not wrong. Well, apparently, if you follow in the footsteps of Iron Eyes Cody, that will lead you in one direction that John calls darkness. But if you follow John, you will, by the grace and the mercy of Jesus, take ownership and be honest and confess, this is who I am, and accept his call to maturity. And by so doing, you will experience forgiveness and growth. Thank you.